You know, we've been entertained for so many years with wonderful concepts like the glory of God. And um, I think it was left to the audience to fabricate their own pictures of how do you see the glory of God, you know. And most of the time it was something very remote and something very almost unapproachable and some distant light, you know, and glorious, perhaps the, uh, you know, the evidence of, of the, the smoke in the tabernacle, you know, and, and lightning. And, and it's so wonderful to discover that the glory of God has found it is most, its most unique expression, its most complete articulate expression. In Genesis 1.26 when God said, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. You see, Van Gogh is perhaps more known for his self-portrait than for any of the wonderful paintings that he has produced in his career. And I want to encourage you to consider that you are the very self-portrait of God. You're His masterpiece, His workmanship. And He has given face to His glory. He's given weight. The Hebrew word for glory is the word kabot, which means weight, substance. The Greek word doxa speaks of the original opinion, the authentic, the blueprint thought, the thought that birthed you. Herod was mentioning from James 1 verse 18 this morning where James says that he, this God, who is the father of lights with whom there is no variableness. He brought us forth by the word of truth. Your beginning, your genesis is in God. We began to touch on a few large concepts yesterday. And I hope to just go back in such a way that you will clearly see. I think we've mentioned, perhaps not in this context, but we've mentioned over the past few days that humanity share three births in common. Just to help us comprehend our beginning. No we did not begin in our mother's womb. Our parents had the pleasure to conceive us and perhaps an equal pleasure or challenge to raise us. <laughs> but ultimately we are the idea of God. We began in God's thought. Every single human life, whether they know it, acknowledge it, believe it, or discard it, has one common Father. The Father of lights, with whom there is no hidden agenda. It would have been impossible for God to enter into His rest, His Sabbath. What would His, what would his Sabbath celebrate? If what he saw as product to his intent, his image, his likeness, for the first time in the, universe, in the history of the universe, now resident and reflected in human form. God's Sabbath was directly connected with what God saw, not just by faith, but in visible form. That's why Paul says in Colossians 1.15 that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Where did God go invisible again then? If he was made visible already in Genesis 1, when he saw his image, and Adam's first conscious moment was when he awoke in the adoration of his maker. Where our English translation says that God blessed them. The Hebrew word is the word barak. It literally means to kneel down like a parent would kneel down and, and hold the newborn. 
in absolute awe. You began in the awe of God. You see, for so long we've allowed our minds to to translate any definition of mankind into some horror picture. We've given so much credit to the fall and to the fallen mindset. But God has a, a reference to us that predates Adam. And I want to read you just as a start, if I can get this going, to our thoughts this afternoon. I want to read you from... Um, Let's go to 2 Timothy. And we'll have a look at verse uh, chapter 1. And I want to read you verse 9 from the Miller translation. It's good in most translations, but let's just have a look at this in from the mirror. Paul writes here, he says, He rescued, this is God, who rescued the integrity of our original identity and revealed that we have always been His own from the beginning, even before time was. Do you see the very first Thing that Jesus came to redeem was our understanding to original ownership. A thief never becomes an owner and yet in our theology we've handed over ownership to the thief. John writes in his first chapter of the Gospel, remember John's now more than 90 years old and he says he came to his own and even though his own did not roll out the red carpet there was no place found for him in any of the posh hotels or inns he was born in a stable ownership was never in question Psalm 24 verse 1 says the earth is the Lord's the fullness that of the world and those who dwell in it <laughs> planet earth is the property of God and God endorses this by saying I swear by no one higher than myself as surely as I live all the earth shall be flooded with the what with the knowledge of my glory even as here's the picture even as the waters cover the sea every nook and cranny so God is not standing casual towards this planet, ready to hand over 99,9% .9 to the devil and his friends. When Jesus tells those three powerful parables in Luke 15, have you noticed that all three parables have one thing in common? The what sheep? The lost sheep? The lost coin? The lost son? What does the word lost suggest? But ownership. Yeah. So you cannot be lost unless you belong to begin with. So when Paul writes this to Timothy, he says, God rescued the integrity of our original identity. You see, sometimes we misinterpret scriptures like 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I hope we get time to go there in detail, but here, you know, we've, we've quoted for so many years, if any man be in Christ, is a new creation. And then some of our translations even say, a species that never existed before. If that was true, then um, God's Sabbath in Genesis could not be justified. Then Jesus indeed had to come and apologize for faulty design. God's Sabbath celebrates His work to be complete from the beginning. So He rescued the integrity of our original identity. 
And we're going to see how this rescuing act of God happened. Because we say we are sharing as a human race. We are sharing three births in common. Mankind began in God. When Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, he does not say to Nicodemus, you must be born again. He says, unless a man is born, anuthen is the Greek word. Anuthen means from above. And you remember that we looked at, uh, I'll just write it down there for you. Because you know, today you can't say things without having people go and Google what you've just said. <laughs> I'm so glad. What a happy day. <laughs> People used to sit there and they just looked stupid and the professor would stand and teach, you know, from the Latin Bible. And <clears throat> because in John 3.13, Jesus qualifies what I just said. He says, Unle he says, no one ascends into this realm. He says to Nicodemus, you would have no appetite for God. You wouldn't bother to put your job at risk. To be associated with this new rabbi on the marketplace if you were not drawn to recognize a common birth that we share no not our mother's womb yes the second birth that every human shares is his mother's womb you did not arrive on planet earth any other way Jesus's passport to planet earth was Mary's womb you didn't just fall out of the sky. The way far it your new bring me. The stalk did not carry you to planet Earth. And the third birth that humanity shares in common is where I hope we will go to this afternoon and tonight in our teaching. The one Peter refers to in 1 Peter 1 verse 3 when he says, We were born anew when he was raised from the dead. We need to understand that the newness of our new birth has everything to do with our minds radically rescued from the lies that we believed about ourselves because we ate the fruit of the wrong tree. I call it the I am not tree or the DIY tree do it yourself so we're gonna go into this rescuing act of God but allow me to just read verse 9 of 2nd Timothy otherwise I'm gonna to forget to get back to it that we've always been whose his own from the beginning even before time was this has nothing to do with anything we did to qualify or disqualify ourselves we are not taking religious good works we are not talking religious good works or karma here are you familiar with the karma idea I remember a friend of mine, Neville Norton, from Pretoria, told me once he, he was speaking to a, a Hindu guy in, in, in Durban and all, and he told him, so tell me about, you know, the Hindu religion. <laughs> the guy says it's a very simple philosophy. You try to do good, and then by the end of the day you calculate what you've done, and you realize if the scale is a little bit out of balance, then you just try better next time. So it's just the good and the bad that you constantly weigh. So Neville said to him, and... and if you're honest about it, how did you fare in the last 24 hours? Oh, the man hung his head. Is it not so good? <laughs> he says, and can we take it a little bit further back? The guy was getting nervous by now. He says, the last week, how did you fare according to your philosophy in terms of the good and the bad? And the man was shaking his head. He says, it's rather embarrassing. He said, if we take this over the last year, over a lifetime of your belief, the man says, my belief does not work. I never had the pleasure to introduce him. 
to something that carries more weight than his best effort to, to qualify himself. So let's just quickly read here. This has nothing to do with anything we did to qualify or disqualify ourselves. We're not talking religious good works or karma here. Jesus unveils grace to be the eternal intent of God. Here is what grace communicates. Grace celebrates our pre-creation innocence and now declares our redeemed union with God in Christ Jesus. For so long we have seen grace like we would see an overdraft facility. I don't think we get those things easy anymore. But remember overdraft facilities, how it would work, you'd have to in those days, you, know, you could go and play golf with a bank manager and um, try and influence him, you know, but just, just to get his favor so that you can extend your overdraft facility. And for so long we thought that grace was God's ability to tolerate our bad behavior. So we kind of live permanently in the red. And then most of our prayers was about, you know, God, can we extend the overdraft limit? Can we? Can... <laughs> the idea of um, uh, pay now, sin later became a popular concept in the early church. I have to tell you this little joke, maybe you've heard it a hundred times, but he was a little Giovanni, born in a very poor family. And um, it was getting closer to Christmas. So Giovanni was prompting his dad. He says, Dad, my friends, they all have BMX bicycles. I, Giovanni, I have nothing. His dad says, Johnny, come on, don't talk to me about this. You know we have got no money, but here's what you do. I give you a good idea. You go to your bedroom. On your knees, you write baby Jesus a letter. And you ask him for a BMX bicycle. Johnny thought, well, let's go. So he's in his bedroom, he starts writing, a dear baby Jesus, this is me, Giovanni. I'm very poor. Da, 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 da. All my friends were. He says, I promise I'll be good for one year. Please give me BMX bicycle. He reads through it, he realizes, absolutely impossible. Tears up the page, starts writing it. Oh, dear baby Jesus, forget what I said just now. I, I promise I'd be good one month. <laughs> He's down to a week, tears it up down. He's down to his last day. He says, dear baby Jesus, I promise I'd be good for one whole day. And he's absolutely devastated. He realizes there's no deal. <laughs> Tears up the paper, walks to the house, absulking. Suddenly he gets the most brilliant idea. There on the piano was a statue of Mother Mary. While nobody was looking, he grabbed the statue under his arm, he runs off into his bedroom, opens the bottom drawer, takes out the undies and the socks, hides Mary, closes it all up and he starts writing, oh, Dear baby Jesus, are you going to see your mother again? <laughs> So here we have religion in trouble. Because how do we bargain? You see, religion cannot afford your innocence. And here Paul speaks about grace that celebrates your pre-creation innocence. <laughs> you see, when God says in Hebrews 10 of your sins and your iniquities and your unrighteousness, you name it, I will think no more. God has no reference. But one single testimony, the testimony of Jesus Christ, is the testimony of God concerning you. Can you see what an insult it would be to try and remind God of sins? Like the other brother, he was so quick to remind the father, remember, don't treat him too kindly. Remember what he did to our family name. He has to pay. How dare you feast his return? So grace does two things. It celebrates our 
pre-creation innocence and declares our redeemed union with God in Christ Jesus. Verse 10, everything that grace pointed to is now realized in Jesus Christ and brought into clear view through the gospel. Jesus is what grace reveals. He took death out of the equation and redefines life. This is good news indeed. <laughs> oh my Lord. So we share three births in common. We began in God. Unless, Jesus didn't say you must be born again. He says, unless a man is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What does he see? He sees the soul realm reality through his physical birth. Our physical being has what it takes to exist on planet earth within the soul realm reality that which is flesh is flesh but man shall not live by bread alone why because man is so much more than flesh but by every word we've translated that word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The word every in the Hebrew is the word K-O-L which speaks of the word in its most complete context. It's not every scripture in the Bible. It's the word that was before time was, the logos that John speaks of. Face to face with God. On a mission to become flesh. We are designed, we were brought forth by that word. And we have built into our beings the most natural appetite for a word that is not satisfied by the labors of the flesh. We are designed by that word. So we were brought forth by the word of truth. In Morocco there is a wonderful old legend that's been told for many hundreds of years concerning the original sin. And the story goes that Eve was tempted by the serpent to eat of the fruit of this tree and his deal was if you eat of this fruit you will become a lot more beautiful than what you are. She immediately refused. She said, well, I have no competition, so why bother? And I mean, God told us not to eat of this fruit, so I'm okay. He says, you are making a big mistake. Why? Because Adam has a secret lover that is hiding there in the mountain. And if you care, I'll go and show you. So she felt a little bit inquisitive and followed him. Got to this cave, and he prompted her to look into the cave. And as she looked into the cave, she saw in the reflection of the water what she thought was this other most beautiful woman. And she immediately grabbed the fruit and ate it. And the legend goes that all who are not deceived by the mirror reflection returns to paradise. Do you see what the I am not tree communicates? The I am not tree sponsors every principality, power and dominion outside of the revelation of God's glory and of His kingdom. The striving to become 
the striving to get there, the striving to be the striving to be the striving to qualify. Paul says while we compete and compare ourselves by one another, we are without understanding. But thank God for the gospel. John says in 1 John 1, 5 verse 20, we know that the Son of God has come. And He's given us what? Understanding. To know Him who is true. And to know that we are in Him who is true. Those two little words, in Him, in Christ, those two words are the pin code of the Bible. It's impossible to understand the gospel until you understand in Christ. Of God's doing are you in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30 Maybe I'll just write it down for the sake of your reference. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. Ephesians um, 1 verse 4. 1 John 5 verse 20. Of God's doing. You are in Christ. Not because of something that you finally get right. So that even God can accept you. Yeah. The word that I've translated in Ephesians 1 verse 4, ek logo, out of logic, out of the original thought, speaks of an association. And the word association is a beautiful word because it means the one cannot be brought to mind without immediately being associated to the other. So if we are in Christ, then God cannot engage with one single thought that includes Jesus but excludes you. So in the economy of God, mankind is fully represented in Christ. In our sport disciplines, we know so well how our national or club heroes feature on our behalf. People get so engaged with the game that you can tell by, they, by their mood the next day how their team fared. We were talking about it on our way now to the school this morning. I remember one night, Ronaldo, my eldest son and I, we were ministering in Kampala in Uganda. And we were woken in the middle of the night with a very loud noise. And it was loud in the area where we lived anyway. It was a very loud area of Kampala. But this was like going through the ceiling. And um, so the next morning I asked the folk there, I said, listen, what was this noise all about? They said, no, you know, Manchester United beat Barcelona 1-0. No. <laughs> Suddenly, wow, I said, Manchester United, wonderful supporters they have in Kampala. <laughs> and isn't it amazing, you know, we can, we can have our sport heroes and project our ourselves in their goals that they score on our behalf and draw the energy of satisfaction from something that happens outside of our control but at least we feel associated but sadly we may know all the statistics about our heroes we can know them better than what they know themselves because of Google <laughs> We can know things about them that they don't want their fans to know about. But you know what? They don't know you. So our fellowship with the Father is not built on our acquired knowledge through years and years of traditional interpretation. We only have one valid reference to this understanding that He has come to gift us with. It's how He has always known us. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 Then you will know even as you have always been known. That to me is the most comforting thought that I could ever ponder to know that I've always been known. You see, so when we go back to the transaction that we looked at briefly in Matthew 13 and verse 44, where the man discovers what? A treasure that was hidden for ages and generations in an agricultural field. Meaning that for generations the cattle that grazed there and the plows that cultivated the soil 
missed the treasure and kept people for generations engaged with the topsoil, the top layer. But a man discovers this treasure and he hides it again. I struggled to understand this hiding it again but initially until the day I think I mentioned it to you when we were preaching in the Baptist Church in Zurich and it suddenly struck me how much of South African gold that was found in a mine somewhere in African soil and transported into a vault under a bank in Zurich what happened to the gold it became currency and now it's hidden again but its effect is of global significance there in its rest mode the gold's not jumping around saying here I am here I am you weigh me again weigh me again just make the gold's just lying there but the multi multi billion dollar industry attached to the weight the glory in the gold zips across this planet beyond our calculation a city set on a hill cannot be hidden people misunderstand our gospel and label us as universalists do you know what the universal philosophy is? Everyone is okay. Read the newspaper. They are not. Multitudes of nations are in deep capital letter. Trouble spelled with an S. They are. They have no way out. Their economies, their politicians, their cultures have failed them. Isaiah says in chapter 60, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the people. <laughs> so what do we do? Just go into universal mode and say, well, everyone's going to be okay anyway, so we'll just kind of hang in here. No, no. While the gold lies undiscovered, not weighed to determine its accurate value. There is no currency, only darkness. This gospel of seeing every single human life equally valued and included propels you with a greater urgency than what the law of works and fear and uh, guilt-driven motivations could ever do. Paul says, I labor more than you all. And Paul was running right in front there under the old zeal. You see, when Isaiah sees his birth, he says, for unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government rests upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and of the increase of His government and of His kingdom, there will be no end. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. You see, Paul speaks of another zeal in Romans chapter 10 when he bears witness to the zeal that he was so oh, familiar with under the Jewish religion. He says, man, we had a zeal for God. He says, but it was not enlightened. Because we sought to establish our own righteousness. We sought to establish some, some level of um, behavioral performance and moral standard whereby we could qualify ourselves to feel less sinful. But in Romans 7, we remember Paul writes Romans 7 for the Jews. He says, I'm writing to you, verse 1, 
I'm writing to those who are familiar with the law. Yeah. He says, let's be honest. The good that our law power inspires us to do, we cannot do. I thank God that there is another law. If you ever learn to fly, your instructor will quickly tell you that there is a principle in flying and it's called the law of aerodynamics. The shape of the wing is designed to make this aircraft airborne in a certain condition. And then this new law supersedes the law of gravity. Paul says what the law could not do, grace has done. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. When James write about it in, writes about it in James chapter 1, he calls it the law of perfect liberty. God is not in the process of trying a little bit harder this time. To rescue his image and his likeness in man and in woman. He did this once and for all. You see, God is in his rest and his rest was not interrupted. His rest was never at risk. Because God knows something. And in the gospel, God came to speak a language that cannot be hidden. Because the man who found the treasure and hid it again went away and instead of doing what religion would want him to do go and buy a bargain oh it will make a great story you know from poverty to riches here you bought this field this neglected old field overgrown with thorns and thistles and boy you bought a gold mine the point was Jesus is communicating to a blindfold humanity to uncover to them a language that will give them a reference to their original value redeemed. So he goes and does the most ridiculous thing. He sells all that he has and he buys the entire field. How can exclusivism exist in the language of scripture? Why would the entire field be bought? Because in God's economy, the entire field carries the same value. And God was not trying to persuade him of the value. He was persuading us of our value. Because God desires, says Hebrews 6.16, God desires to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose. Remember when we touched yesterday on Isaiah 55? I was mentioning to you how I had that shocking statement float into my head one night at two o'clock in the city of Budapest and we were preaching like 12 hours a day and I thought I need to sleep and God says let me just wake you up with something quickly at two. There's nothing wrong with the world. So what's wrong then? The world is thinking wrong. <laughs> Sorry. What is that YouTube little joke of the German guy in the, in the, in the war? <laughs> May they, may they, we're sinking. <laughs> no, no, they, no they, they, the German guy got the, we're sinking, we're sinking. So the German guy who's operating radio says, it's quite far. He says, so what are, what are you zinc thinking? <laughs> it's not part of the basis. But <laughs> no, I'm thinking. I, what are you thinking? <laughs> Sinking. <laughs> your thoughts are not my thoughts. Therefore, your ways. So we are wasting our time to try and people to get to behave better. Yeah. If the problem is thinking wrong. You know why we're thinking wrong? Because we're standing under the shadow of the wrong tree. The I am not tree. So any action prompted, I mean we can sometimes feel so justified, so valid in our responses and reactions and our behavior. But hey, if it's from the wrong tree, the fruit will continue. 
to show the exact same harvest. Through willpower, we can make a hundred quality decisions to lose weight or to do something, go to the gym. And here by Wednesday, you get a, a decision of greater authority. And it snakes and ladders all over again. Snakes swallowing me. And just fall, throw the dice, try to get there. The I am not tree engages multitudes in a system of failure. The gospel introduces us to a greater authority. So when Paul speaks about the righteousness of God, I'm just sinking a little bit because I know that is normally and she reminds me I didn't complete the previous story. Before we go to the righteousness of God, which is where we're going to be for the whole week. Um, the thing that the gospel addresses, if there's nothing wrong with the human race, is that which appeals to every person's conscience. Now we looked at that word um, briefly the other day. The Greek word for conscience is the word sun edo. Let me write it like this. Sun edo. Sun means together with, edo to see, or conscience. Which we said is the opposite to the word hades. Hades. Ha ides. Sun edo is God inviting us to see what is absolutely obvious to the spirit man. You know, with technology today, we have learned over the years that you can just turn on the TV or go Wi-Fi and immediately access what your natural ear cannot access. You cannot go and stand on your toes and try and get a signal. It's, it's, it's just in a different sphere. And here, God invites us to see what He has always seen. He has made His image and likeness visible in the most beautiful music. When our son Stefan played in the Gewandhaus, it was now November, two years ago in, in Leipzig, he did the first piano concert of Mendelssohn. And it was just such a moment for his parents to sit there and witness our boy, you know, a young boy who left home when he was 17, being honored to play with this amazing orchestra. And you know the thing that, that overwhelmed us? It, here we were in a facility that was shared with Mendelssohn 200 years ago. And Mendelssohn wrote, this was his first piano concerto. And long beyond Mendelssohn, the music continues to live because it was written on a page somewhere. And the original sound was captured there. And that original sound has found a voice again. So the incarnate word has brought us to a place of understanding the truth about our origin. Our beginning, our genesis, for so many years we've been so flaky, in, even in the born again movement, you know, we've gathered statistics, how many people can we just get to say the sinner's prayer, and then the statistics became embarrassing, because most of the people that we got to, like my friend Umpiri said one day, you know, they were in the service, and um, this one particular guy, he would kneel out at every altar call. I mean, the pastor could count on him. When he makes the altar, this one gentleman would kneel out yet again. So one day they asked him, now why do you do it? Why do you kneel out so often? I said, feel so jammer for the pastor. He says, I feel so sorry for the pastor. <laughs> so we've gone through these rituals of trying. This time, do you know what was wrong? 
We try to engage with our willpower. We taught that love is a decision. And we've engaged with the wrong system. I need to take you quickly to Romans chapter 3.25. Oh Jesus, thank you Lord. Romans 3.25. Uh, Romans 3, 27 I think it is. Romans 3, verse 27. He says, what becomes of our boasting? Paul says, in the context of the gospel, it is excluded. Religion hates that. Because now I've got nothing to sell. He says, by which law? And then Paul mentions two laws. The law of works. He says, no. <laughs> the law of works is the very law that supports my boasting. But sadly, my boasting has off days. Where the very same energy that was ignited into boasting became shame, regret, guilt. Because it's attached to the same principle, the same law. And the operating system of the law of works is called will power and we have taught seminars on how to use your will power if your your decision fails you make a better a more determined decision and i mean our decision can take us far in the natural world ask any gymnast or any athletic star I mean, you can really, I mean, you can, you can pump those muscles and become some super strong person. But sadly, the strongest can only lift up a certain weight for a certain time. And then their knees begin to buckle. Because willpower cannot access the dimension that we are born from. I remember one day in Blantyre, Malawi, we... We're in an air aircraft ready for takeoff. And it suddenly struck me that Isaiah 40 begins with a runway. I mean, in, if you travel, especially those days in Blantyre, there are some areas in Malawi where you need 4x4 mode permanently. And it'll take you a day to cover 100 kilometers, you know, because of the condition of some of the roads. But this airstrip was just so beautiful, such a beautiful airstrip. And suddenly I saw Isaiah 40, every high place shall be brought low, every valley filled up, every crooked place made straight, even the rough places made smooth. And I could sit strapped into this aircraft, absolutely enjoying the moment, knowing that I'm strapped in the right vehicle. This vehicle is designed and the airstrip is designed to match what this aircraft needs in terms of gathering momentum and then for the law of lift to propel this aircraft. And suddenly I saw Isaiah saw more than just our redemption. Thank God for what the picture of Isaiah 40 sees concerning our redemption. But God prophesied aircraft. Because Isaiah begins with this runway and concludes with mounting up with wings like an eagle. What is the context? The young men, the athletes become weary and exhausted because world power has a sell by date. It's called exhaustion. But remember, there's another zeal. The one exhausts, it's called the zeal for the Lord. Yeah. But to the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. And the zeal of the Lord will do this. Can you tell the difference? Yeah. Difference between the zeal for God and the zeal of the Lord. Yeah. The young men become weary and exhausted and some of them faint. But they that kava entwine with God. The Hebrew word kava. It's such a powerful word. It's like Bluetooth mode. With the thoughts of God and your thoughts because you are, you are God compatible by design. Where His thoughts and my thoughts engage, engage in throne room language. And the next moment I'm airborne. Mounting up with wings like an eagle. 
now doing the very thing that exhausted me yesterday yeah. running not weary walking and I don't faint you see the Spirit of God desires to give us access to the life of our design we come from above we're not on our way to heavenly places we are seated there together with Christ to begin there in fact we never left there what was that lovely old prophecy Ek moet later in Lydia sy my herinner, ach, so van nie, maar gaat my nou vertel nie. <laughs> what happened? When Adam fell. He fell into darkness. Into death. What did he die to? He died to the consciousness of his innocence. And he became alive to the awareness of his shame. Here God comes to fellowship with him. And God is surprised that they are hiding from him. The initiative of God in the gospel is to engage us with his thoughts concerning us. But because of the extent of Adam's fall where his whole illusion became willpower driven, willpower motivated, it was like now trying to use the same runway to get airborne but I am strapped into the wrong mindset you can upgrade to Ferrari mode you're still not going to get airborne you'll burn a lot of fuel you'll go up and down the widest and longest runway but you're not going to get airborne because you're strapped in the wrong vehicle that's why Paul says even a little leaven leavens the whole lump the law of works cannot do it because it has the wrong operating system but if we discover how the law of faith which is the second law that Paul refers to in Romans 3 27 he says what becomes of our boasting excluded by which law by the law of works no by the law of faith what is the law of faith all about if the operating system of the law of works is willpower how does faith work Faith works by love. When the love of God is realized, faith ignites. This is what this Kava is all about. It's a love encounter. It is a place of intimacy where there is an entwining of thought, where the thoughts of God, in spite of the situation that I sense, where I feel so downtrodden and so whatever the thoughts of God engages with my thoughts and the next moment have you seen how you could be working on your laptop happily and you're really going for it and suddenly you notice 5% power lift and then you start thinking not what the next sentence is going to be is where is the charger and the relief that you have when you just get this thing in before you lose the document and, you, and, and you engage that power and the little light comes on and wow now if we can do that with our technology if we can engage into a power socket that immediately translates into the device that we operate and that we go online how much more and how much more effortless is this place that he's invited, invited us to? This place of Sunedo, of seeing together, of engaging together. This place of Kava, where this encounter becomes not something towards a certain result. 
You see, that's the wrong mindset again. But seek ye first my kingdom and my righteousness, then all these other things will be added unto you. That's how we've interpreted that verse. What I really want are all these other things, but in order to get there, I've got to get intimate with God. <laughs> God is not trying to con us into a cheap recipe to success. He invites us to discover the life of our design that is only to be found in Him. Because when Paul speaks to the Greek philosophers in Acts 17, he says to them, quoting one of their philosophers, he says, In Him we live and move and have our being. And then Paul makes this logical conclusion, uh, because one of the poets said, We are indeed His offspring. He says, If we are the offspring of God, come on guys, I know you are very artistic in your expression and you've carved amazing images out of wood and stone and decorated it with expensive stuff and wonderful and your altars and your shrines are very impressive and wonderful tourist, touristy things, you know, especially for the click age. I mean, it was fantastic, but you're missing the point. If we are his offspring, how can we begin to look for God in the figments of our imaginations? God is not our idea, we are His idea. Paul says the only thing that could possibly separate us from Him is what our altars are all about, sponsored by our sin consciousness. He says, I've got good news for you. This God, who is not more Emmanuel to the Jew than what He is to the Gentile, this God who is not far from each one of us has overlooked the times of ignorance. What is Paul's reference? The Gospel. Paul has a complete understanding of the Gospel. He's not t chancing you know, this new audience to try and impress them with a few nice scriptures that he's memorized. Paul is absolutely persuaded of every single person on planet earth who stands equally valued in God. He says God has overlooked the times of ignorance. And before they could ask, but what do we do? He said to them, this God is now urgently pleading with all humanity. Go and read that again. Say, Act 17. All of mankind where? Everywhere, far beyond your Greek identity, your Greek culture and ethnic um, uh, connections. This planet stands as the immediate audience of God. He says, God pleads with all of humanity everywhere to awaken here, in there thoughts. Can I just write you that word again so we can just see it clearly. One of the most unfortunate words in the Bible in the English translations is the word repentance. Because it does not belong in the language of the New Testament. It's a Latin word that was deliberately brought into play because you can make a lot of penance out of it. If you can keep your subject guilty, you can earn a lot of income, especially if you add a re in front of the penance. This word has no relevance in the New Testament. Religion loves this word. Because now they translate Acts 17, now God pleads with all of mankind everywhere to repent. And then our minds go, was <laughs> geld The Greek word meta, no, yeah. Meta is the Afrikaans or the German, meet, meta, together with, no, no, yeah. That sounds very similar to the word that we just looked at, sun, edo. Sun, together, adjoining, joint scene. It's a junction of thought. His thoughts, our thoughts. And I'm concluding with this. Paul says, 
in Acts 17. 17, verse 31. He says, why? He's explaining the gospel. Why would God be so urgent about all of mankind encountering this metanoia moment? All of mankind, three births. We come from above to begin with. We began in our mother's womb. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, we were born anew. Hosea 6 verse 2, the only scripture in the entire Old Testament that references the third day resurrection includes us. After two days he will revive us, on the third day he will raise us up. So we were born anew when Jesus was raised from the dead. We have a brand new reference. This is why the gospel is communicated in such a way, writes Luke in Acts 14 verse 1. He says, Paul preached in such a way that many believed. You don't have to teach faith. Just reveal the gospel. Faith happens. Faith happens. The more we teach faith, the more we go into spooky world. Because we never quite sure. Because we go back into the world power mode. Did I mean it this time? And I said, Oh Jesus, I believe. I'm going to say the sinner spirit in capital letters this time. <laughs> it is our encounter of the faith of God. Go and read Habakkuk chapter 2. The just shall live by his faith. You know whose faith we were talking about? Our faith. When Jesus says there is only one faith. Have the faith of God. He who by God's faith, God's faith defines your life. So Paul says God metanoia. He he, he includes the mankind to come to this metanoia moment. Why? What is Paul's reference? And now he brings in the prophetic word. Unfortunately, because it sounds future tense, we put it future tense again. Paul brings in the prophetic picture, what the whole scripture is all about. God appointing a man and a day. And on this day, in this man, God would judge the world innocent. And one day, the guilt removed. From whose memory? From ours? Depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. God says to him, you can no longer call any man sinful or unclean. Because the Lamb of God took away the sins of the world. Why did God have to do that? For Himself or for us? Has He known us any differently? He says, no, now you may know even as you've always been known. Picture the the father of the prodigal. Was the father's mind influenced by the gossip? He's always known you. And the gospel announces your pre-creation innocence. And the gospel gospel speaks the language, the scapegoat language of our condemnation, of our guilt, of our sin consciousness. And what the blood of bulls and goats could not do, the blood of the Lamb did once and for all. God sold all that He had. Why? To persuade us more convincingly of our original, now redeemed value. Of our original, now redeemed identity. Of our original, now redeemed innocence. God wasn't in a transaction with the devil. He didn't deal with the thief. He wasn't trying to, you know bargain down our value like when you go and buy a cheap second hand something and you try and point to all the flaws hoping that you'll be able to get the price better he goes and he sells all that he has and now that it's paid for the gospel unveils the original value the gospel confronts mankind with their authentic value, their authentic identity, their authentic innocence.
The DIY tree keeps you busy, very busy, with faking it until you make it, and you never make it. Oh, wretched man that I am, is the conclusion of the language of the I am not tree. <laughs> oh, my Lord, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the metanoia moment. I have awoken in your likeness, morning star, your brightness. I lift my hands in worship to your name. For your glory is within me, to your praise I have been set free. My life is found with Christ in God. Hmm. The lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son, all found safe and sound. This is the gospel. The gospel is not to persuade men. Thank you. The gospel is not to persuade men about his sinfulness and his lostness. <laughs> You can read Moses for that. <laughs> but grace and truth has come through Jesus. There is no other gospel but the gospel of the man Jesus Christ. He is the one who boldly for all eternity declares your innocence. So looking away from what? From my DIY clumsy efforts unto Jesus. I discover that he is the author and the finisher of faith. Faith only has one valid reference, and his name is Jesus. Yes. Wonderful. Yes.